بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا إلما أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجه الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Insha'Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, we're going to continue in reading in our Wednesday night readings of the books of Imam al-Haddad. And we said that we would read through different books uh, and just small sections with reflective thoughts on the words about Imam al-Haddad and his actual words in his books. So today... We continue in reading the two books that we started with reading last week. And as I told you, every week we'll read in a different book. So uh, at the end of this session, I'll add the other book that we're going to read uh, uh, with uh, next week. So that gives everyone the opportunity to uh, get the book so that we can continue, inshallah. Uh, in general, the link for all of the books that we're going to be read, I would suggest that you get them is so you don't have to keep every week uh, waiting for a book so you can follow. So this is the link for all of the books that we will be reading. And as I mentioned, when we finish these English books, then we'll go to the books that are left of Imam al-Haddad that are in Arabic, and then that'll just have to be translations that we have to do. Well, alhamdulillah, we can make it happen. Today, we are honored to have our brother and teacher, uh, Ustav M.J. Tarsin, uh, who is now uh, a teacher at Al Maqasid in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and a sincere seeker and teacher of knowledge so alhamdulillah, he authored, uh, offered to join us today. He accepted the invitation and mashallah, we should benefit. So today we're gonna both, you know, read as the reader reads normally, and then we'll expand. As I told you, one of the things that we wanted to keep in mind that this religion is conveyed through a senate from chains of narration and those who received from those who received from those who received from those who received back to the likes of Imam al-Haddad radiallahu ta'ala anhu all the way back to Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we mentioned among the routes uh, that reached the works of Imam al-Haddad were through uh, Sayyiduna Habib Umar bin Hafid and other of those great teachers in our time from the family of Banu Alawi. And we're going to continue with that connection. And hopefully, inshallah, we get the barakah of those men of that chain and the blessings are given to us to understand these texts to the these texts to the best of our abilities. So inshallah, we'll start on page five. And we left off talking about uh Banu Alawi in Tarim Yemen. Bismillah. Let us recite Al Fatiha to the soul of Imam Al Haddad Al Fatiha. Um, okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. The author, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him, said, Most of the Alawis are buried in the great cemetery of Turin, the Bashar Cemetery. There is a special area reserved for them called Zambal. For this reason, the Alawis refer to the cemetery sometimes as Bashar and sometimes as Zanbel in their writings and poems. 
Such was the influence of the Alois scholars that everyone in the city was bred into behaving in a pattern thoroughly conforming with the Sharia, so that every transaction, whether in the marketplace or elsewhere, was carried out in the correct manner. Even those who did not know learned unconsciously by simply being there. Thus, Turim was said to be the teacher of he who has no teacher. Despite the here, when we talk about the noble descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, known as Alawis or Ba Alawi, they are the descendants of the grandson, great great grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alawi ibn Ubaidullah. Alawi ibn Ubaidullah, all of the descendants from Ba Alawi today come from this great ancestor who is Alawi, the son of Ubaidullah the son of Ahmed al-Muhajir, the immigrant, from his father Isa, to his father Muhammad, to his father Ali al-Uraidi, to his father Ja'far al-Sadiq, to his father Muhammad al-Bakir, to his father Ali, the son of Hussein, known as Zain al-Abidin, to his father al-Hussein, who is the son of Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib, the husband of Fatima, the daughter of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the Ba'alawi. Those descendants, they have that special place in the city of Tarim where they are buried, which is the area called Zembel in that cemetery. And it is the famous place where the righteous descendants of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are buried. And also in that Semel al-Bashar, is the Sahaba. Some of them are buried there as well. And it is a custom of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah to visit those cemeteries and to pray for those righteous that are buried there, to seek barakah by way of them, to ask Allah tabarakah wa ta'ala by their status. And <clears throat> that connection is a part of the life of the pious in every time and place, especially in the city of Tarim, to the extent that every affair of coming and going and making decision has its connection with the righteous that are buried there and, th and seeking uh, their blessings and closeness to Allah by their status is a part and parcel of the way of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah to ask Allah by way of the pious whether they are alive or have passed from this realm. So that is to make a tawassu by the righteous people. This is the way of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and it is something of agreement among them. Now, and Sayyidi, wherever you want to jump in, uh, you're welcome. Feel free. So just on, on you, you, you said it beautifully, Sayyidi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, everyone. Wa alaikum uh, Mashallah. So here the author says, uh, talking about the Ba'alawi Sayyids, really this uh, beautifully preserved uh, branch of the family of the Prophet um, and this center, their center, which is Tarim. Uh, here the, the author says, you know, even those who did not know learned unconsciously by simply being there. Thus Tarim was said to be the teacher of he who has no teacher. I remember when I first got to Tarim as a student in 2006, I went to the souq, to the marketplace, which is kind of like a traditional marketplace where there's different kind of, almost like a pop-up shop where all these people come together and they sell their, their goods. And I was just buying some dates. So I remember, uh, I can't remember, it was like half a kilo or something like that, about one pound of dates. So they have the old school scale. So you put the dates on one side and he put the measuring thing on the other side to balance that out. And just right when it got almost to the balance, he put another scoop of dates in. And I said, no, 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 you don't have to give me extra. And he said, no, that's in the Quran. This is in the Sharia. Ah. And I'm supposed to give you a little extra than the mizan, just to, than the scale, just to be on the safe side. And I said, subhanAllah, I'm already learning fiqh from a businessman in the sug, in the marketplace. So I just remembered that story when we read that paragraph of just how the, the, the beauty of their character and their teachings, people pick it up just being, by, being around them. Allah. <laughs> Go ahead, continue. 
Despite the political turbulence, the people at this time were much closer to Sharia than they are today, which, is, which was because the environment forced them into an almost ascetic mode of living. Yet their practices were still so remote from the ideal Islamic society in the imam's mind that he often complained about the rarity of those who were seriously interested in their religion. Temptations and makers of sedition were, to his mind, too many. The people's hearts were divided because they were obsessed with the accumulation of worldly things. Many of the inhabitants of Turim, he once remarked, were unaware of the existence of his books. In one of his letters, he writes, The people of the time, as you can see, are people of sedition and discord, wasteful of one another's rights and transgress transgressing beyond limits. Were someone to govern them who neither resembles nor suits them, he would find himself in trouble and things would take a critical turn for both him and them. The righteous man is as precious as a jewel, and the people of this time are like those who are holding dirty stones with which to either break or soil it. Whoa. And In another letter, he says, this is a time when honesty has gone, religion has grown weak, and treachery has become rampant. The people are in chaos. Their energies are concentrated in their stomachs and genitals. It is equal to them whether they are falling or rising. And so long as they can obtain their worldly desires, they care nothing for how they fare with their Lord. If one thinks about what Imam al-Haddad mentioned in this, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's describing 300 years ago in a remote place in the world. So when we're talking about Hadramaut, in that area, in the city of Tarim, that's far, far, far away in the very southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Even today, that's still considered a remote place if you ever have to actually, as I told you last week, to drive there, you see how much, how remote it is. And that is prior to internet, all these modern things, even today, it's still rough. And Imam al-Haddad looked at the people of that time who were people in our sight would be the greatest of the awliya if we saw just their worship. He's not talking about people who were anything like us, right? We're talking about people who if we saw them, we would have looked as if they were angels who descended from the sky in terms of their worship. If you read their histories, and we'll talk about them, these people were phenomenal in the way they worshiped. But even that, Imam al-Haddad considered that falling short. As we read in the Book of Assistance, in the introduction, where Imam al-Haddad, he mentioned himself as one who admits that he's falling short and deficient. That's Imam al-Haddad talking about. So he wants us to elevate our standard to the bar, not bring the bar down. And that's a rule that we should take in ourselves. Even if we don't, we're not like them, we should try to emulate them. Because in emulating those pious people, there is success. And in another way, when we look at this, we shouldn't be kind of discouraged. Look at the side of Imam al-Haddad's speech on the side of the good deeds of the righteous are the sins of the elite. Hasanatul abrar, sayyatul akhyar. Look at it from that scale. And even if we are among the righteous, which we don't claim, even if we were among them, we should try to strive to be among the elite. It should always be an upward movement with us no matter what level we are. Mm. In another vein, in another... <laughs> Imam al-Haddad saying jahid to shahid. So we should take that. Struggle and you will witness. Mm. In a different vein, however, he once remarked, Turim is the town of the Sayyids and the superior people. To live therein is a gain for the virtuous and the righteous. There is nothing to match it nowadays except the two honorable sanctuaries. The first Halloween to occur, inshallah, Sayyidi, no. this statement from your own uh, experience in Tareem, no. that this is Imam al-Haddad talking. No. There is nothing to match it, meaning Tareem, nowadays except the two honorable sanctuaries, no. meaning Mecca and Al-Medina. From your own experience, 
what do you have to kind of like support that statement and that right. idea from your own feelings? Yeah. So just to even compare it to what Imam al Haddad said right before that, it goes back to what you were saying, Imam Amin, about how we need to be in every time and in every place is that we need to continuously improve. But then at the same time, also affirm what is good. So Imam al-Haddad, they say, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مَقَالٍ yes. In each situation, there's a certain thing that you have to say. So when he's talking about how people could be better, or if you compare them to their predecessors, how they were, there's room for improvement. But then when you look at Tareem and the reality of Tareem, and that this is uh, the highest concentration of the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, with the purest chains of transmission along with Syria and other great places of learning, you have uh, this, this uh, uh, high density of Ahl al-Bayt and of people who are descendants of the Sahaba. So like the three main families in Tirim are the family of the Prophet Sallallahu the descendants, uh, and then two major families, Al-Khatib and Al-Bafadr, that are descendants of Sahaba. So you have this entire society that is built upon the foundation of the preservation of this deen at the highest levels from father to son, through their children, through their, their lineage. And I remember another story right before going to Tarim, I had this really interesting dream where I was in like this big room and all of these people were wearing white and they were wearing turbans. And every time the Prophet's name was mentioned, they stood up out of respect. Every single time the Prophet's name was mentioned, I remember when I got there, someone who does dream interpretation said, that's Tareem, that this is the place that has the, and there are other great places as well, but the most reverence and love for the Prophet And the way that I would just describe it to people, and it's almost indescribable, you have to see it for yourself, is to live there and, and living there, you know, uh, 300 years after Imam al-Haddad is speaking, to live there, it felt like the closest thing to living in the time of the Prophet Like everything there is centered around ibadah and dhikr and love of Allah and love of his messenger, love of the righteous, uh, prayers, gatherings of dhikr, uh, commitment to sacred knowledge, beautiful akhlaq, you know, beautiful character and values. Uh, so it was like, you know, it was so easy to practice Islam in those kinds of environments. And it was as if you were, you know, close to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first Alawi to acquire the name Al-Haddad, which literally means the ironsmith, was Sayyid Ahmed, rahimahullah, son of Abu Bakr, rahimahullah. This Sayyid, who lived in the ninth century of the Hijrah, took to sitting at the ironsmith's shop in Turin much of his time. There happened to be another Sayyid Ahmed in Turin in those days who was well known and had numerous followers. The ironsmith was unable to bear the fact that his friend Sayyid Ahmed, rahimahullah, whom he knew to be a man of Allah Ta'ala, was totally ignored by everyone, while his namesake was so renowned. He criticized the Sayyid so much for this that he answered the ironsmith one day, <coughs> excuse me, Allah Ta'ala willing, you shall witness that which will, that which will please you. Soon afterwards, people began to flock to the shop to greet the Sayyid, sit with him, and ask for his dua, supplications, or prayers. It was not long before the ironsmith found himself unable to work in his shop, so crowded it had become. He said, O oh Sayyid, this is enough. I am now convinced you are as I thought you were. Thereafter, to differentiate him from the other Sayyid Ahmed, people took to calling him Al-Haddad, and so were his descendants named after him. There is an indication here in this story that we should take that wherever we have the opportunity to spread goodness, to teach religion, even if it's in our homes, in our businesses, in our shops, they should become places of learning and drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that even you would find a lot of the scholars, they wasn't just in the masjid, rather, they were in the general places where people could connect to them and benefit them no matter where they were at. And I think we should think about that in our context that there's always a benefit where we're at to be drawn, to be extracted. And we should make, we should expose ourselves 
to those benefits wherever they may be. Mm. One of the virtuous Sayyids of the line of Al-Haddad who lived in Turin was Sayyid Alawi ibn Muhammad Al-Haddad, rahimahullah. To him, on the eve of Safar, the fifth of the year, excuse me, the fifth of the year, 1044 AH, was born a son whom, whom he named Abdullah. At the age of three or four, Abdullah, son of Alawi, suffered from smallpox, which left no disfiguring scars, but deprived him of his vision permanently. And our teachers, they said about Imam Haddad, he lost his sight, the physical sight, al-Basr, as a youth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exchanged that physical sight for al-Basira, for that sight of the heart, which is much stronger and much more piercing. So that through his basira, he was able to reach people and touch hearts that would change them. That's why he became Haddad al Khulub through his, bas his basira. Through that inward sight, he was the iron smith of hearts. Radiallahu mm ta'ala -hmm. anhu. And when someone, whenever Allah illuminates their basira, the basar is just, uh, you know, the, the physical sight is just secondary. So the story of the man, there was once a man who heard of Imam al-Haddad in his lifetime. And he thought like maybe people are exaggerating about how great he is. So he came to his gathering and Imam al-Haddad is sitting at the other end of the room. And he tells the man, be careful, a fly has just dipped its wing into your tea. Make sure you dip the other wing like the Prophet said, you know, so that there's a poison and a cure in it. And the man was shocked, like how could someone who doesn't have physical eyesight be able to perceive you know, something as small as a fly at the other end of the room. And he knew that he was a man of Allah. So inshallah, we'll move to the book of assistance, inshallah, Risala to Mu'awwana, uh, on page number three, inshallah. The author, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him, said, and none can be of more benefit to Allah Ta'ala's creatures than those who invite them to, the, to his door by teaching them the necessary knowledge of Tawheed, monotheism, and obedience. Remind them of his signs and graces. Give them tidings of his mercy and warnings of his wrath, which strikes those who expose themselves to it, whether they be disbelievers or merely transgressors. Mm -hmm. I was prompt to obey this formidable command and was reinforced in my wish to attain to the generous promise given in the aforementioned verses and hadiths, as well as others which I have not mentioned, by a truthfully aspiring brother, a Sayyid who treads the path to felicity, who asked me to write to him with a counsel to which he might firmly adhere. I have answered him through the aforementioned desire to obey his commands, win his reward, and obtain his assistance, hoping and that he... mentioned that this noble Sayyid was Al-Habib Ahmed Ibn Hashim Al-Habashi. He was a contemporary of Imam Al-Haddad. And every time I think about him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they were both companions in seeking knowledge and traveling the spiritual path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their sheikh, a sheikh, uh, Umar ibn Abdurrahman al-Atas, who was the sheikh who gave Imam al-Haddad and uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hashim al-Habashi their spiritual opening. And one time, uh, it's always this story really shows me the importance of this book, that one of uh, the students came and he was a sheikh in his own right to the musnad of Hadramaut al-Habib Aydarus bin Umar al-Habashi radiallahu ta'ala anhu who all these noble chains of the Ba'alawis go through him. He is like a central figure in the beginning of the 14th century. He died in the year 1314 after Hijra. Uh, so someone came to him and he said, I want to read a book in at tasawwuf in Sufism, in spirituality. So Al-Habib Aydarus bin Amr al-Habashi, he said, bring the book of assistance, Risalatul Mu'awwana. So that person, he looked like 
I wanted to read like a big book, like Ihya Ulumidin or Qutul Qulub or Awarif al Ma'arif, you know, one of those big major texts. So he, he pointed something to him that I think we should be constantly reminded about this. He pointed to him. He said, who wrote this book, the book of assistance? He said, a Sayyid Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad. And he said, he is al-Arifu billah, the knower of Allah. He said, who did he write this book for or to? He said, al-Imam Ahmed bin Hashim al-Habashi. And Habib Aydarus bin Umar, he said, who is an Arif billah. And I want you to think about this. He said, if this is a treatise written from a knower of Allah to a knower of Allah, what do you think it contains? al marifa Subhanallah. Gnosis, realization of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So when we look at that, that this book should be a opening for us to travel the path of realization of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So don't look at its size, look at its content. And that is the genius of Imam al-Haddad rahimahullah ta'ala that he is able to have a mirror into that prophetic quality of specialization in terms of saying little words that have vast meaning. So in this book, the book of assistance, we have a few words, but in them are all of the meanings like one of the great descendants of the Prophet, Al-Habib Abdullah ibn Muhsin al atas He said that the books of Imam al-Ghazali or the speech of Imam al-Ghazali is directed at the states of hearts by way of divine unveiling. Listen to this. The speech of Imam al-Ghazali, Kalam al-Ghazali, right? It is ala ahwal al on the states of hearts. Bil kashf, by way of unveiling. This is a secret Allah has given Imam al-Ghazali to talk about the states of the heart. And then he said, the speech of Imam al-Haddad is a summary of the speech of Al-Ghazali. So what does that mean? That he was able to take that massive unveiling of Imam Al-Ghazali and translate it in a way that would benefit the common people. That's a special secret in the works of Imam Al-Hattad that we need to extract. Because it is written for us, with us in mind, to give us these high levels of understanding in a form that will transform us, right? And that's why he named it the Book of Assistance, right? What? For those of the believers who are diligent or eager to travel the way to the hereafter. SubhanAllah. There's a lot of things in that. So, and it also tells us they didn't write things from their own self. They wrote it to benefit. So someone else inspired. So even when we think about this book, we should think about Al-Imam Ahmed bin Hashim al-Habashi and how he benefited us by his sincere request of asking Imam Haddad to write him some advice. And we benefited from that. And remember when we were reading in Riyadh al-Salihin that the one who indicates to good receives the word of everyone who does it after him without that decrease in their reward. Imagine the reward of Al-Imam Ahmed bin Hashim al-Habashi for putting that request to Imam al-Haddad, that we're benefited 300 years later in America. SubhanAllah, that is a gift. Mm. I have answered him through the aforementioned desire to obey his commands, win his reward, and obtain his assistance. 
hoping that he, exalted as he, will attend to my needs as his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah Ta'ala's blessings and may blessings and peace be upon him, has said, whenever a man attends to the fulfilling of his brother's need, Allah Ta'ala shall attend to the fulfilling of his need, and Allah Ta'ala will assist his servant as long as the servant is assisting his brother. I seek Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness and do not claim... There is, there is a need that we all have, right? Imam al-Haddad, in one of his poems, he said that there is a need inside of me. Fulfill it, O you who is best of fulfillers. That need is acceptance and the pleasure of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So the more we facilitate the real need that we have, we need the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need that Allah accepts us. And everything that aids to us, assists us in that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the one who facilitates that, is going to fulfill that need for them. May Allah make it easy for us, inshallah. Maybe you can expound on that line. MashaAllah. Hajatun fil nafs. Ya Rabbi. Wagdiha ya khayra gadi wa arih sirri wa gilbi man laulaha wa shawadi. Naam, subhanAllah. I think you said it beautifully, Sayyidi, in, in terms of seeking that. That that's the most important thing. Even there's a lesson in what you just said about knowing our own priorities in this life. That this knowledge, this ibadah, this path that we're taking is in order to fulfill the greatest and most permanent and most important of our needs, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's good pleasure. And I've also heard that some, uh, some scholars say that that need that he's referring to, another way to look at it and what he was referring to is also being in the company of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the highest level of paradise. Allah. is to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is once again an indication of the highest rida uh, and good pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa arih sirri wa galbi and give comfort to my innermost secret, my soul and my heart. Min uh, wa shawadi by fulfilling this need from the, 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 the burning desire to fulfill this need. And then seeking to fulfill that need for others. And as uh, Imam al-Haddad, he says, uh, And the way to seek that, the best way to benefit other people, and as was read before, that all of creation are Allah's dependents. They need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, uh, the most beloved of them to Allah is one who's of most benefit to his other uh, creation. The way you benefit people the most is through teaching people Tawheed, connecting them to Allah, connecting them to the Messenger, teaching them those things that they need in order to be successful in the Akhirah. And we ask Allah, as Imam Amin said, to give us Tawfiq. There's a lot of work to do and how to really make th this knowledge accessible to people and to help people, especially in all the madness and the craziness that's going on in the world today. People are going to be lost. Like there's certain things in today's world you can't even recognize self-evident truths. This is a man. This is a woman. This is like these kinds of self-evident truths. They're trying to destroy that in people's minds so that they can tear them away from their fitra. But that's going to lead them to a very dark place. And then 5, 10, 15 years from now, when those people realize that they've been fed a lie and they're going to start looking for the I need something that's true. Give me truth. Because I tried falsehood and it took me nowhere. We need to be able to give people this, inshallah ta'ala. I seek Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness and do not claim that my intention in writing this treatise is confined to these good religious purposes. How may I do so when I am aware of the hidden desires, egotistic passions, and worldly wishes that I harbor? I do not claim innocence for myself. The ego is indeed an inciter to evil, save when my Lord shows mercy. My Lord is indeed forgiving, merciful. The ego is an enemy, and an enemy should never be trusted. It is, in effect, the worst of enemies, as the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may blessings and peace be upon him, has said, Your worst enemy is your ego, which is between your flanks. How inspired is the verse of the poet. Beware of your ego, and trust not its mischief. The ego is worse than 70 devils. 
O oh, Allah Ta'ala, I seek your protection against my committing idolatry, shirk, knowingly, and your forgiveness for that did of which... You, did you fix the thing that is missing? I have a line, O oh, Allah Ta'ala, guide me or inspire me with my guidance and protect me from the ego of my ego? Yeah, that goes in before the line. So after, after the, point, point, the ego is worse than 70 devils, then... O oh Allah, inspire me with my guidance and protect me from the evil of my ego. And then the next line. How inspired is the verse of the poet? Beware of your ego and trust not its mischief. The ego is worse than 70 devils. Mm -hmm. O oh Allah Ta'ala, guide me or inspire me with my guidance and protect me from the ego of my ego. O oh Allah Ta'ala. The evil of my ego, right? Shari nafsi. The e evil of my ego, right? The evil of my ego? Yes. Excuse me. Oh, you said the ego of my ego. The evil, I apologize. I'm sorry, my bad speech. The evil of my ego. Min sharri nafsi. And protect me from the evil of my ego. Mm -hmm. Oh, Allah Ta'ala, I seek your protection against my committing idolatry, shirk, knowingly, and your forgiveness for that of which I am not aware. Mm. I have begun each chapter in this treatise by saying, you must... One of the ways to protect yourself from the evil of your ego is to remain obscure and secluded except when the sacred law dictates you mix. The one of the ways to protect yourself from the evil of your ego is to remain obscure and secluded except when the dictates of the sacred, sacred law necessitates you mix. So when are those in beneficial gatherings, in the congregational prayers, in the Friday prayer, visiting when necessary visiting, the Eids, right? Funeral processions. Wherever there is something that the sacred law remind, uh, encourage us to engage in mix, we engage in mix with the intention of adhering to the dictates of the sacred law. Whenever there is not a call for that, we should be obscure and secluded. To the extent that Imam Haddad gave us the recipe of curing the ego by avoiding fame. To the extent that he said, Rahimahullah, I don't love fame, nor do I love those who love fame. Subhanallah. Because that is a quick way for the ego to become untamed by being too in front of the people because it opens up the door for showing off. So keep everything based on the sacred law, even when you mix. Mm. I have begun each chapter in this treatise by saying, you must do such and such a thing. This being addressed particularly to my own self, my brother who was the cause of writing the treatise and generally to every Muslim who reads it. This expression has an effect on the heart of those it is addressed to, and I hope that, having used it, I will escape the reproaches and threats directed against those who say but do not do and those who know but do not act. For if and, I just... And keep this in your mind, right? The scholars, they said, Knowledge is only for practicing. So whenever we addressing anyone, we should first address ourselves. I have knowledge, even if it's a little bit, I must practice it. And I am accountable for that knowledge, even if it's one uh, case. As the Prophet, as uh, Imam al-Haddad radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, man alima mas'alatan wahida fa huwa alimun biha. Whoever knows one case, one ruling, 
He's learned in that, and therefore he must act according to it in reality. He knows it, then you have to practice it. Whether that practice is an outward practice or an inward practice by the heart. Because you have al-a'mal al-badaniyya, you have those physical actions, which you do with the body. And then you have al-a'mal al you have those actions of the heart. They're all actions. And all of them should be based on knowledge. As Imam al-Bukhari said, al-ilmu qabla al-kawli wa al-amal, that you must learn first before you speak or practice. So both outward and inward. And the most important is that inward practice, right? Those al-wajibat al those obligations of the heart. Because once that is right, then the outward will follow it in rectitude. Mm. Feel free, uh, uh, Sayyidi, whenever you want. Um, I'm benefiting from listening to you, Sayyidi. Mm. Go ahead. For if I address myself saying, you must do this, this indicates that the thing has not yet become a reality through my practicing of what I know, and that I am still at the stage of prompting myself, <clears throat> excuse me, to practice what I preach. In this manner, I would neither be deceiving the believers nor forgetting myself. For this is how Allah Ta'ala has described those who have no understanding. Do you exhort people to goodness and forget yourselves, and you recite the book? Have you no understanding? Surah 2, Ayah 44. And I would thus be saved from the threats directed at those who speak but do not act, as in the words of the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may blessings and peace be upon him. A scholar, Alim, will be ordered to the fire. His entrails will spill out, and he will drag them along as he moves around the fire just like a donkey turning in a mill. The people in the fire would gather around him and say, why does this repudiated man make us suffer more than we already do, than we do already? And he will say, this repudiate enjoined good, but did not do it and forbade evil, but committed it. And when I was made to journey by night, I passed by men whose lips were being clipped with scissors of fire. I asked, who are you? And they said, we enjoined good and did not do it, and forbade evil and committed it. These threats come true for those who summon to Allah Ta'ala when their real intention is to acquire the things of this world, and who exhort to good but persistently abandon it. Here, I want you to think about something. Hmm. When we're reading the works of Imam al-Haddad, and we talk about that senate, that chain, they all lived the meanings outwardly and inwardly of what Imam al-Haddad conveyed to those who followed him at each level mm. of that chain, at mm. each level. And this is something that's unique about the family of the Prophet wasallam from al Alawi. This is something unique. Every level of scholar and teacher and follower did their best to implement the advice of those who preceded them mm. and to strive to acquire that level. One of them was Al-Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir, rahimahullah ta'ala, who the book we read, Sulam at tawfiq the book that we read, The Ladders to Success. He was three levels after Imam al-Haddad, right? Let's see who would tell us those three ranks of Imams and great scholars between Al-Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir and Imam al-Haddad. Quickly, let's make sure we are reviewing. So what are those three high-ranking scholars that has direct chain to Imam al-Haddad from Al-Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir? Who are those great knowers of Allah? Quickly, we can put it up. Inshallah, MJ, let's see if they're connecting. They should be able to do it. We review this every time when we talk mm -hmm. about so that people get connected to them, have a love for them, and they put them in the place where they belong. So that chain becomes living for them. Mm -hmm. That's something we're saying without a connection. Okay. While they do that, 
I want to tell you something about what Imam Haddad just mentioned that uh, Al Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir said. So he was giving Al Habib Aydarus bin Umar al Habashi some advice. So it was a wasiya giving him some advising what to do. So he told him, All right, here we go. MashaAllah. So that chain is Umar bin Saqaf, who relates from his father, Saqaf bin Muhammad, a Saqaf who relates from Ahmed bin Zayn al Habashi, who is relating from Imam al Haddad. Excellent. Okay. Allah. May Allah reward you. And the sisters put Al Habib Umar ibn, uh, ibn Saqaf from Habib Saqaf ibn Muhammad al Saqaf, Imam Ahmed bin Zain al Habashi. Good. MashaAllah. So, men and women, everyone's following. So, Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir gave his student, Habib Aydarus bin Umar, some advice. So, he said, the advice, right? Is al ihya al bidaya and al arba'in al asl. So he's giving him advice, meaning read the ihya of Imam al Ghazali, read bidayatul hidayah, the beginning of guidance, and al arba'in al asl, the 40 principles, which are three books. All of them are translated into English. Then he said, in them are an explanation of the book in the Sunnah. Look at this advice. In them are the explanation of the book of this in the Sunnah. Then he said, what has held us back is not the lack of advice and a little bit of knowledge that hasn't held us back. Not that we don't have advice and not that we have a little bit of knowledge. Look what he said. Really, what has held us back is the lack of practicing. SubhanAllah. That, that is something to think about. We are getting advice. We're getting encouragement. Knowledge is accessible, but practicing is missing. SubhanAllah. We have to practice. Right? That's something to think about. Yeah, we have this. Now we're getting advice. This is a book of advice and it's full of knowledge. Are we going to practice it? Every line in this work is a source for us to practice, whether outwardly or inwardly. So we should read this book, which was their habit. They would read the books over and over and over and over and over again till they became the books. Right? They want to actually be the book of assistance, be the ihya, be bidaya to hidayah, to become it. And that is, right, a process, as Imam al Haddad mentioned, or excuse me, not Imam al Haddad, Al Habib Muhammad bin Zayn bin Sumait. He's a biography of Imam al Haddad. He said that when you repeat, Things become established and firm inside of you. And when things become established, you become illuminated. Mm. And when you become illuminated, you're able to travel the path to Allah. So there are steps. There is repetition. Mm. Repetition will allow that thing to be established inside of you. When that thing becomes established inside of you and a part of you, you will be illuminated by way of it. And when you become illuminated, it will make it easy for you to travel the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think of all of those steps, right? That, that is something to think about. That's heavy. Think about it. How I'm going to get that. They're giving us the road. And this is those who learn directly from Imam al-Haddad who themselves became masters in the way. So if we just emulate them, repeat, read over and over again, then it becomes established in us, a part of us. Then the benefit of that, the barakah of that knowledge becomes light, illumination, nur, right? From Allah, 
And by that nor you walk the path. Do you reach your goal? Which is Ma'rifatullah. Al Qurb min Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Subhanallah. Being in proximity with Allah Ta'ala. And that's the object of all of this to be a winner. Mm. Now, uh, who warn against evil but persistently commit it, who fall into ostentation and wish to make a reputation for themselves. As for those who summon others to Allah Ta'ala's door while upbraiding their own selves, forbidding them to be neglectful and exhorting them to show zeal, it is, it is to be hoped that they will be saved. Anyway, the one who knows and teaches what he knows but does not practice is in a better state, a wiser way, and has a safer outcome than the one who knows but neither practices nor teaches. A man of little understanding may perhaps say... I mentioned something about this too. Sometimes we know, but we are not at the level of practicing what we know. Sometimes we know, but because of a taqsir in ourselves, we fall short and we're not able to do. That should not prevent us from conveying and teaching what we know, right? Imam al-Haddad said, both are obligations upon you to practice and to convey. So if you fall short in one, don't fall short in two. So still push yourself. Even if you're not practicing, still convey. And then push yourself to practice. But don't say like many say, I'm not like them so I can do nothing. No, the only way you're gonna become like them if you start working, Yeah. right? So do both, inshallah. And Al-Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir, he indicated this in his saying when he said, there is no consideration in admitting you're falling short when you're really falling short. Rather, the real consideration, when we're going to be really taking into consideration the statement, is when you're working hard and you admit you're falling short. So there is two concepts here. Yeah. One is called a taqseer, and the other is called a tashmir. So what he's saying is, when you're in the state of falling short, which is a taqseer, you're falling short. To say I'm falling short, there's no consideration to that. That's obvious. Where is the real consideration? When you're in the state of a tashmir, you're really diligently working, and at that state, you say, I'm falling short. Hmm. SubhanAllah, that is, that's Jews. Yeah. That's what he said. When you're really working hard, and at that point, you say, I'm falling short. Hmm. Not when you're falling short, you say, I'm falling short. <laughs> when you're really working hard. So let us always be in a state of diligently endeavoring to follow this religion in its most excellent way. Hmm. Even when we do that, realize that we have a lot more to do, hmm. right? Excuses are the gateways to inaction. Hmm. Stop making excuses for ourselves. Even if we are falling short, we still have to work hard because it is possible to achieve higher ranks. But those ranks are not achieved by wishful thinking, rather by diligent effort within our capacity, not above our capacity, within our capacity. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, Imam Amin, that's exactly kind of how Imam al-Haddad is saying that he starts every chapter saying, Wa Wa you must, O oh brother, you must, O oh brother, do this. And he says, I'm speaking to myself first and foremost. And so, Imam al-Haddad probably put most of what's in this book, if not all of what's in this book, into practice when he was a young boy. But always seeing that taqsir, even in the tashmir, that falling short, even in his complete mastery over all these things and having a sense of humility. And he's not saying, I'm going to hold back and not teach. I'm teaching. 
but having a humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, I am the one in need of these reminders. I'm always in need of guidance. I'm in need of higher levels of nearness, higher levels of realization. And it's just this, when you see these, these uh, complete inheritors of the Prophet their akhlaq is just so uh, complete from every angle that they're working hard, but still witnessing their own shortcomings and, and the humility that they have, subhanAllah. Let's finish this last uh, uh, few lines and then we'll be uh, finished the opening, inshallah. A man of little understanding may perhaps say, there is already a sufficient abundance of books. There is no benefit in compiling new ones in this age. Such a man would be correct in so far as books are indeed abundant and should be sufficient, but not in saying that, that, but not in saying that no benefit is to be gained from compiling further books now. People's hearts are naturally attracted to everything new, and Allah Ta'ala gives them at each time knowledge clothed in the form best suited to the age. Books reach distant places and survive the scholar's death, who receives the merit of spreading knowledge and is accounted by Allah Ta'ala among the teachers and summoners to him, even after he has entered his grave. As the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may blessings and peace be upon him, has said, the one whose tongue gives life to a virtue that those who come after him practice continues to receive its reward until the day of rising. I have called the treatise the book of assistance, support, and encouragement for such believers as desire to follow the way of the afterlife. I ask Allah Ta'ala to make me and all other believers benefit from it and to render my compilation of it purely for the sake of his noble continence. It is now time to begin. Success is from Allah Ta'ala. I seek his help depend on him entirely and ask him to grant me success in being correct in my intentions and deeds. He is guardian of this and able. He is my sufficiency and he is the best of patrons. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, Sayyidi, if you would close us out with a few words and a closing dua as we have a we've reached the end of our time, Inshallah. And, and we thank you for coming and spending this time with us. It is a blessing and Inshallah, that we will see more times where we come together and cooperate mm -hmm. for the benefit, inshallah, of us all in the, this ummah, inshallah. Uh -huh. uh, Bismillah. Firstly, thank you for the invitation, Sayyidi. Benefited from just uh, your teaching and your words. Jazakumullah yeah. khairan. And uh, Jazakumullah khair to all the brothers and sisters who are regularly following along. Uh, please be consistent in these classes. Uh, take them very seriously. Do I don't think anyone does, but it helps to hear it from someone else. Don't underestimate the value of the knowledge and the, the scholarship that you're receiving. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase you all uh, and to recognize, as Imam Amin alluded to in, 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 in different ways, the purpose of knowledge is amal is you know putting it into practice worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifying our hearts these outward and inward actions establishing the sunnah of the prophet them inwardly and outwardly in our lives and then once we have knowledge and once we put that knowledge into practice and then uh, as you know was said that it becomes so regular that then we walk the path of of the akhiran we become people of nur of light then that light has to spread to others. That there are so many people in the darknesses of kufr and in the darknesses of distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I believe this from the bottom of my heart. And it's true. It's true at the ultimate level. So it's true for this country and it's true for all human beings that the only hope for people's salvation, for people, the restoration of what is good in this country and everywhere is this deen. Is this, this is the last chance. So we have to do it right. We have to be committed. And recently, one of the great scholars, Habib Abu Bakr bin Ali al-Mashhur, passed away. Great Imam. One of the great living Imams, he passed away. And then the question you got to ask yourself, and this is what Imam Amin was saying, the work has to go on. Who is going to take the mantle? Who's going to pick up his inheritance and carry the baton forward? And the answer is we all have a role to play. Nobody can take on uh, uh, that kind of load from one of those great Imams. But we all have to step up and we all have a role to play. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and that we witness the spread of Islam in large numbers in this country and all over the world. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that that would occur at the end of time. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq wa jazakumullahu khayran. Close us out inshaAllah. Minkum Sidi, minkum. Al-tamis minkum. Atlub minkum al-dua Sidi. Al-Fatiha. Barakallahu bikum. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 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 Wa s